Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannick here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today, we explore the multifaceted legacy of Asian Americans. In recent months, as we know, they've increasingly become the targets of hate crimes. I have a couple of statistics from a, a think tank courtesy of yesterday morning's paper. Uh, across the country in the last quarter, there's been a 164% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. Uh, New York, the worst at 223%, 140% in San Francisco, and 80% in Los Angeles. So it's very sobering. Uh, a range of other issues also come to mind. These are more background issues. Uh, Asian Americans in international study programs as well as Asian nationals in study programs here. Charges of intellectual espionage and the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. Our special and welcome guest and my own very old good friend is the distinguished logician, Professor Gary Marr of State University of New York at Stony Brook. We begin in prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Professor Marr, Gary, if, if we might, uh, could you tell us a, a bit about your background? You are from California, are you not? <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. I was born in Richmond, California, and I was a colleague of Jim at Loyola Marymount while I was finishing my PhD at UCLA. Uh, there I met uh, wonderful people like uh, Rhonda Chervin and Bob Hurd, and, and especially Jim, who affected the way I wanted to be an academic. I um, ended up at Stony Brook, but I... Uh, remember finally those days at Loyola Marymount. Um, I, let's see, uh, what was the question again, Jim? Well, anything more about the background, just to give us a little okay. context. Well, I, I grew up in Sacramento. Um, my, uh, I, I learned a lot about, well, uh, let's see, um, I think, first of all, that the what's going on now is because of a lack of Asian American history in the public mind. And because Asians are missing from that history, they often uh, feel as if they're, they're eliminable. They're not really part of the American story. And part of what I, I, you know, had growing up is I didn't know that history and I had to discover it uh, just, you know, like a decade or two ago. Uh, when I um, decided I needed to teach Asian American history, I had uh, approached a donor, Charles Wong, um, after he had come back from China and after I'd just come back from China with the uh, Society of Christian Philosophers. And I felt that there was a need to know this history. Uh, two Asian American girls at a local high school had committed suicide on the Long Island Railroad, Ellen Liu and Millie Sabuti. And they had met in the Gifted and Talented program in third grade, and my oldest daughter was just about to go into that program. And I thought, you know, that it couldn't be just an accident that these two Asian American girls had made this suicide pact. And I wanted the university to be a place where these issues can be talked about and discussed. And so um, that's how I got involved. I approached a donor, Charles Wong, to, to, to just 
modify a hallway. It was just this hallway that wasn't being used. I asked my dad, um, who was a World War II veteran, uh, you know, to draw the plans for that. And he drew it. I submitted it to Charles and uh, he decided to donate the money for the hallway, but also $25 million to build an Asian American center on my campus. And at the time, it was the largest donation in the history of public education in New York. And so there was no education. So I said, well, I have to learn this. I have to start uh, teaching myself. And I advocated for it to be uh, recognized to the American Philosophical Association. And uh, that was successful. Um, and so I just ended up teaching it for a decade or two and learning it and teaching my students about that history. Okay, Mara, you want to take us forward? We got a good context already. Yes, um, it's very interesting. Um, I'm curious about what you said that the history of Asian American is missing. There is no narrative, or it seems mm -hmm. there is no narrative that can explain where uh, your people are coming from. To what um, factor you attribute that, um, that situation? Well, it's, it's due to several things. It's the, the stereotype of Asians as always being foreigners, no matter how long you've been here, I'm third generation, you're still not considered truly American. And uh, there's also the uh, perception because of the way the history is taught that Asian Americans are silent resigned victims. If you look at the pictures in history books, the most famous ones are either the Transcontinental Railroad meeting and it says not an Asian face is to be seen, even though Chinese were 90% of the workforce coming from California. But the famous photo is just saying they're absent. Um, another picture that you'll find in history books is a, a Japanese child sitting on a suitcase looking forlorn and people being herded into uh, trains, 110,000 uh, Japanese uh, Americans were put into these uh, detention camps, concentration camps in 10 deserted parts of the United States. Two thirds of them were American citizens. And the other third were forbidden to become American citizens by discriminatory laws. And yet the um, 442nd, which is the most decorated battalion of its kind uh, in uh, military history, the all Japanese American force that fought in the European theater because they couldn't, weren't trusted to fight in the Pacific theater, um, were sacrificing their lives at a rate um, that was phenomenal. And you know, the, the, the amount of decorations they obtained is still historic to this day. But yet they were doing this while their wives and their families were in the internment camps. Um, Asian Americans are often afraid to say concentration camps, but that's what they were. Um, they're afraid to say that because they don't want it to be compared to the death camps, which uh, uh, Jewish uh, people were subjected to in, um, in Europe at the time. But it was a horrible part of American history, and it's still there, uh, even though eventually uh, the government apologized uh, for this. Um, the uh, legal precedent is still there. Uh, Judge Roberts wrote the dissenting opinion and said, it's still there like a loaded gun that can be used to detain uh, people in times of crisis. And that's what we've seen after 9-11. After 9-11, the hate crimes went up not just 200%, it went up 1,600% against people of that looked like uh, uh, Muslim or Arab or South, you know, West Asian, uh, the the uh, conditions are there because at times of economic hardship, people need a scapegoat, and they scapegoat Asian Americans because they're characterized as model minorities, right? Model minorities for whom the the, the stereotype came about in the '60s to discipline the civil rights movement, so. If you're a model minority, you're a you're a minority and you're a model, but model for whom, right? It was saying that here are people that pull themselves up by their bootstraps because of their cultural values and people who are demonstrating in the street for civil rights should not uh, um, 
be so violent and and follow these model minorities. But you know that history is not true. Um, uh, first of all, um, many Asian Americans are in the poverty level. You know, people from Southeast Asia and so forth. They they don't use uh, federal services. Uh, also. Uh, being stuck as a model minority means that you get violence from not only whites, the dominant group, but also from minorities who resent being held up uh, to a model. Uh, I I had the privilege of interviewing Yuri Kochiyama uh, while I was doing this teaching. Yuri is pictured in the famous photo, uh, Time Life photo with uh, Malcolm X. Uh, she was in an internment camp during World War II. She was a journalist. Her husband was in the 442nd. And then after she got out, she arranged for Hiroshima maidens to come back to America to get plastic surgery on their faces uh, with Jewish doctors. And then she moved her family to work in Harlem with Malcolm X. And when I went out to uh, interview Yuri, she was there in her walker. She was living in a black retirement home in Oakland. And she was still getting calls to go to rallies. And uh, I have one of the few interviews where she talks about uh, how Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were coming together in their philosophies. Um, she said Malcolm saw that King was able to get great crowds. And Martin Luther King was starting to see that Malcolm's analysis of what was going on uh, uh, was deeper than just talking about civil rights. Uh, Martin Luther King was starting to criticize the Vietnam War because a great percentage of the people who were dying were African-American men. And when he was told not to talk about that, he said, I fought against segregation so long, I can't segregate my consciousness, my conscience. And he, uh, you know, both of them were, were assassinated along with Kennedy and, and um, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, you know, um, I, I've, I've worked with activists who, who knew um, these people. And what, what Yuri said to my students, she said, learn history and change the world. Um, there's a beautiful documentary made about her by um, one of the civil mothers of the civil rights workers who were killed in the South, you know, the Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman. Goodman's mother uh, financed a documentary called uh, Yuri Kochiyama, Passion for Justice. But I, I felt privileged to go out there and interview her, um, you know, before. You've been, you've been emphasizing history and Christopher writes history texts. So I want him to come into this conversation. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is more of a question or observation, but it's something you can comment on. Something you said, we were talking about earlier about how that we, in a sense that Amer people don't seem to understand the, the whole idea of the model model minority. A Mexican fellow, a friend of mine from um, the Yucatan years ago said to me, he said, one of the problems that he faced, he thought was a problem with relations with Mexicans was that some people tended to think that Mexicans were more virtuous than whites. And therefore they kind of put up this ideal. He says, we you know we're, we're just as human as everybody else. We have, there are good Mexicans and there are bad Mexicans. And he wanted that to be acknowledged. Um, two, I was thinking my, my wife's mother is from the Philippines. And um, when I first started dating my wife, we would, we would go out in different places. And she was able, I, uh, for me, coming from my middle, middle, middle Western family background, um, the uh, or, uh, people from the uh, Asians Pretty much looked the same but my wife was pointing out the difference she said no that's from that person's chinese that person's japanese that person's indonesian that type of thing there's i wonder to what extent is is, is that that lack of um understanding of is it a lack of a full grasp of the actual humanity of people who are just different from us both in um the fact that they can be evil even that or that there are there really are differences amongst Asians, which are as profound as the differences that you will find, say, between Europeans. Yes, I, I agree that, that uh, uh, the, you know, all groups are just as human as other groups and have good and bad. But the way stereotyping works, in my opinion, 
is that there is a good stereotype and a bad stereotype, and people are not allowed to be in their full humanity in between. So uh, if you uh, are in a faculty meeting and you um, are supposed to be as uh, you know quiet and a model minority, but you speak up and you object to something, all of a sudden you're put into the category of the angry Asian person or the uh, the bad Asian person, and, and that's how stereotypes work for um, people of the generation my my parents grew up. There was Charlie Chan who was the model minority and Fu Manchu. And you had to be one or the other. As soon as you act up, you're put in the bad category. Same thing for women. Uh, Anna Mae Wong played both the dragon lady and the lotus blossom, right? So one uh, stereotype is the woman who can, uh, uh, you know, who, who knows, has a lure and is able to seduce um, men. And the, the evil version was the, uh, you know, the version that uh, drew men into their... Um, into depravity, right? But the, 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 way, the way it works is that you don't become human, you're not in between because we don't have the stories of, of, of real people. We have, the, we have these stereotyped polar opposites, which are mechanisms of control rather than uh, ways of giving humanity to, to, to these stories. Um, can I show you a picture? Sure. Okay, so let me um, tell you an example of a, of a, of a story here that um, has been helpful uh, when I have, um, this, is a, this is a picture of, of, of my dad. Uh, he was a veteran during World War II because my grandfather was the informal mayor of Modesto, California of the Chinatown. And so my dad, when, you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed, he wanted to join the Air Force and he had my grandfather who couldn't speak or read English um, sign the form so he could go. And at the same time, he saw his Japanese American uh, kids, you know, going off to internment camps, you know, so, but this is what he was most proud of. Um, it says on the 25th day of October, 1944, the fickle finger of fate finds it expedient to trace on the roll the lucky of the Lucky Bastards Club the name of John W. Marr, bombardier on the Flying Fortress Little Eight Ball, for having this day achieved the remarkable record of sailing forth and returning no less than 35 times, for having braved the hazards of Hun Flack, for bringing to Hitler and his cronies tons of bombs for bending the Luftwaffe back all through the courtesy of the 8th Air Force who sponsor these programs in the interests of liberty loving people everywhere. And uh, on the back, you know, are the signatures of the people on his plane. But you see, my, my dad was, um, he was uh, stationed in Big Springs, Texas, where he met my mom, who was cleaning carburetors and putting them in cars. And he went overseas and 35 missions was 10 more than the standard tour of duty that was 25. People were dying at the rate of, you know, 25% of the planes never came back. Um, some people say Jimmy Stewart's performance in It's a Wonderful Life is so powerful because he was sent for two missions on the front lines in an airplane. Uh, it like this, and uh, he's suffering PTSD. Um, but my dad flew 35 missions, and then when he came back, they got married. They started the first Chinese takeout place in in Sacramento. He used his uh, bomb, you know, his engineering skills. He took out the back seat of the delivery truck and put a pan of water over it, and the steam heated the chow mein, and and all of this uh, was. They they started that, and all my mother's family their younger brothers and sisters came to live with them there. You see, because when my mother uh, was uh, a teenager, her father was the head of a Chinese association, but uh, he was murdered. And uh, she was forced to raise her, her younger brothers and sisters with her older brother. So um, Joseph, and she was Mary, had to raise these kids because their mom was put in an institution uh, because the dominant society didn't understand 
that it was normal for Chinese uh, women to talk to the ghosts of their departed um, spouse, uh, much like uh, Catholics would pray to saints for, for a guidance. And so when her mother was institutionalized, she had to raise these kids. And so that's why she was putting carburetors in. And then they all moved to Sacramento and lived there. They had Southern names like um, Annabelle Lee and Olive and Willie May. And all the Chinese guys in Sacramento would cruise by the Chinese kitchen because these Southern bells had come into town. And it was a cool thing to be a delivery boy for this. And um, so my dad, though, would, you know, because he bombed all these buildings, he went back to Berkeley on the GI Bill and became an architect. And um, you know, if he hadn't been able to do that, I probably would never have gone to college and been a professor. But because he uh, did that, he, he when I told dad after he retired, you know, come back and draw plans for a, a, a remodeling of a, of a hallway, he did that. And he put Charles Wong's name on it. And I gave those plans to Charles. And when he came to speak at Stony Brook, and he had just come back from China, like I had just gone with the Society of Christian, and his heart was changed. And for somehow, he just looked at it. And his wife said, Charles, you know, why don't you do it? And he reached out his hand. And he gave me a check for $25,000 to refurbish this hard hallway. And on the way out of the door, he said, um, why are we doing a hallway? Why don't we do a building? And that's how it led to the the uh, twenty-five million dollars by the end of the year, but I um... that's, that's extraordinary, Gary. That's just really <laughs> extraordinary, and and I, I I can tell how you've come to be an activist while while making your mark initially and continuously as an academic, and in a way you had an earlier model for this blend of the academic and the activist with, with Donald Kalish at UCLA. Is that right? Yeah, Donald Kalish was my mentor. He he hired Angela Davis. He, he was at the Chicago 7 trial. And I I always admired Don because he was a great teacher. He he let people, you know, become his students become important, you know, like David Kaplan and other philosophers. Uh, um, you know, Dana Scott, uh, you know, there's so many people that became famous logicians because of Kalish. But Kalish was that generous kind of person. He, he invited me to uh, author the second edition of that classic textbook because, you know, he had put off becoming a full professor and that was his way of, of doing it. But he, he was very generous in that way. And uh, that's the kind of academic I wanted to become. Uh, I wanted to be the kind of person who was a good teacher. I want to make one more comment uh, before going back to Mario and, and perhaps going ahead to, to other questions relating to Asian Americans. And, and the comment is this. We've had a number of good friends and, uh, you know, well, wonderful people on this program. Uh, just last week we had uh, I think a uh, terrific education in the development of Christian democracy in Italy. So we're, we're kind of far ranging. But what, what person I was thinking of, and here's a connection to Hollywood, and here's a connection to stereotyping, is a fellow named Ron Austin. And uh, he's, he's still with us, very much with us. And he is the last living member of the Hollywood blacklist. Mm. Once upon a time, there's a fellow named um, uh, McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a blacklist. And uh, well, Ron Austin was on it. And because he was on it, he had a, a transition from, from Hollywood to Catholic Charities work. <laughs> It's quite a transition. I'm not going to ramble forever. One of the things that Ron says is, uh, even more so in the past, Hollywood and television, almost nothing to do with art, almost nothing. Everything is prepackaged. Everything that's produced is understood as a commodity. 
And if what you're producing is a commodity, you pretty much shape the, um, the, the subtext for it. And so I suspect that what, what, what's going to happen is perhaps what's already happening is we go from one group of people shaping one kind of commodity to another group of people shaping another kind of commodity. And what gets lost in the transition, it was lost before the transition, is art. Let the story be the story. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that, that we have to at least note. Now, uh, Mario, we've got a number of other questions that we want to ask uh, uh, Gary. I wonder if you would like to lead us into one or other. Yes, um, I was uh, very careful uh, listening to your story. Um, let me tell you a brief background. When I came to, the, to this country 30 some years ago, I wanted to study philosophy, um, speculative philosophy, mainly metaphysics. And I went to a professor who was a very prestigious professor that was the only Hispanic. And probably at that time, there were not many Hispanic at the American Philosophic Association. I think he was one of the very few. And he interviewed me, we spoke in Spanish, and he said, well, it's better for you to study other than speculative philosophy, something about your background. And you need to get first legitimacy by showing that the continent from which you belong or you coming from has also a philosophy. And so, and he mentioned, I remember vividly the expression in 1941, 42, I see Jean Paul Sartre said, well, today Paris and France fell. The Nazi has just destroy our country. And France believed to be the center of humanity, what is human. So we no longer have a awareness of what is human now because the barbarian has just destroyed our country. And he said, that professor said, that was the starting point in Latin America of many to begin thinking about their own philosophy and not co being copied from the French and from the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And he said, you need to start thinking about that. Otherwise you are not going to have any legitimacy in the academic world in this country. So that in many ways changed what I was been doing. Now, when I hear, that's my point, that you are a logician, which to me is something that somehow is divorced from, from history, from something which is more practical, philosophically speaking. And you are not, quote unquote, an expert on Asian American philosophy, Asian philosophy. Um, what do you, how did you become a logician? Which seems to me that's kind of divorced from anyone ethnicity, if you will. Okay, uh, a good question. Uh, I became interested in logic and philosophy in fourth grade when I was reading Martin Gardner's columns and books. And um, that, that sort of uh, was magical to me about how you could solve puzzles and paradoxes. And Martin Gardner put a great deal of philosophy into it too. And many uh, mathematicians and logicians had their start reading Martin Gardner's columns. You know, he was um, he took philosophy classes at the University of Chicago from Rudolf Carnap and wrote one of the few uh, popular accounts of Carnap's philosophy. So that I, I grew up uh, wanting that, and um, along the way, I uh, I experienced a lot of things that didn't make sense to me as an academic. Why I was being treated differently, but they made sense. Uh, once I started to understand Asian American history. So no, let me distinguish between Asian American studies and Asian studies. 
you can ask the question, um, can you understand the civil rights movement in America or the experience of blacks in America by studying the cultures of Africa? And the answer, of course, is no. And similarly, you can't understand the Asian American experience by studying the cultures of Asia. And so there's been sort of historically a distinction between two disciplines, Asian studies and Asian American studies, which I think are coming together these days with the critique of Orientalism and Asian studies and so forth. But um, originally they had two different agendas. Asian studies came out of the Cold War uh, attempt to wanting to uh, contain Asia after 1949 and um, uh, Mao Zedong had come to power. So, like, so my dad was able to join the Air Force and so forth because China was considered to be the good guys and the Japanese were the bad guys, right? They're, they had these famous Time Life magazine articles and how to tell your friends from the Japs. And um, they, they were very stereotypical. They would say that the, the Japanese were hard-heeled and, and so forth and laugh inappropriately, but the Chinese uh, shuffle and uh, are you know are are not as you know and and um, are are more humorous and so forth and this had nothing to do with the distinction between Chinese and Japanese. I mean, I always wondered growing up, why do people say, "Are you Chinese or Japanese?" And you'd answer the question, and they couldn't tell anyway. But why would they keep asking? Well, it was because of World War II. You know, the Japanese were the bad guys, Chinese were the good guys, and they looked the same to people, right? But in 1949, all of a sudden it flipped. Chinese were the bad guys and Japan were the good guys. And you started to have movies like Tea House of the August Moon and you know, these, um, you know, making, um, uh, you know, the Japanese or the Koreans or whatever the, you know, the good guys and the Chinese, the bad guys. And then, again, you know, it keeps flipping like this, even though people can't tell the difference. So it tells you that the purpose of stereotypes is to control a group. So, you know, a lot of anti-Asian hate now is because of the discourse about China, you know, Chinese spies and so forth. And, and um, you know, that uh, it's our greatest economic partner, uh, competitor. And so people treat Asians in America as what American foreign policy is to the countries of Asia. Most of the wars in the 20th century have been against Asia. It began not only with the conquest of the, the you know, the Philippines, the first Vietnam, uh, the takeover of Hawaii, you know, the going around the Korean War, the Vietnam War, you know, all of these wars going around the um, Pacific Basin are an extension of the manifest destiny that the U.S. Uh, felt it was its moral imperative, right? But manifest destiny sort of going around the Pacific Rim. And even today, when we see the conflict in West Asia, it's sort of that same colonial movement. You know, American history really can't be understood outside of the fact that, you know, Columbus didn't just, you know, sail out of the blue in 1492. He was looking for China. He was looking for a route to China. And the Northwest Passage was an attempt to find a shortcut to China. So this idea of the of China being a place where you could get Oriental goods and spices and teas, and it was a place of, for wealth. Uh, this was part of the uh, discovery of America. And today, the same thing. People look at China and Hong Kong that you know, all that kind of stuff as, as, as economic uh, opportunity. You know, the turnover of Hong Kong in 1997 was very important to the Chinese people, but in America it was sort of like, why? What is? Why is this important? Well, you know, the the Boston Tea Party in America was throwing tea over. It was tea from China, because the U.S. and Great Britain had introduced opium into China and addicted people to fix the trade imbalance, and as a result of that, uh, you know, um. There was a commissioner in China that burned up the opium in protest. That was the context for the opium wars. And that's why Hong Kong and the other treaty ports were taken over with extraterritoriality. The, the British controlled that entry point into China. And so finally, when it was returned, it was a big deal around the world for Asian people. But in America, people didn't understand, wait a minute, that's connected to the Boston Tea Party. This is connected to American history. 
America had unfair treaties with China. So when I went with the Society of Christian Philosophers to China to talk about sharing Western philosophy and, you know, uh, lots of religion, I felt that it was important to talk about the healing of nations. And it was important to talk about in the book of Revelation, it says that the, you know, that the, the, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. In Genesis, you have the tree, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in the end, in Revelation, you have this other tree. And part of the healing of nations comes when nations admit what they have done to other nations. So I, I showed a documentary my students had made about Angel Island in San Francisco Bay, where Chinese were uh, put into prison. And the scholars carved on the walls poems in Chinese uh, about their imprisonment. Uh, you know, people would from their villages would spend all this money to send a representative and only you know, the, the best and most qualified scholars were often, uh, you know, there representing their whole village. And yet they were detained on Angel Island because of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. And they had to pass all of these interrogations about their villages, like how many windows was the house two doors down from you? And how many steps uh, were there to your front room? And who was the person who lived uh, on the next block? And uh, of course, what the Chinese did was that they made up imaginary villages so they could answer these questions. And so um, they were accused of being tricky, but in fact, these discriminatory laws lasted for about a hundred years in America. It wasn't until the 1965 Hart Cellar Immigration Act that this was turned around. You know, my dad fought in World War II. The United States passed the Magnuson Act uh, to repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act, but it only raised the quota from 100 Chinese per year to 105 per year. That was the repeal, adding five more Chinese from anywhere in the world compared to 65,000 from Great Britain. So it wasn't until the Hart Cellar Act was, was passed during the Johnson administration that Asian countries were put on an equal footing with other countries. That's why you see the sudden growth uh, of Asian Americans in this country after 1965. You know, my, uh, my uncle, uh, Uncle Joe, who, who um, didn't move to Sacramento and live in the Chinese kitchen was a bachelor in San Francisco. The ratio of men to women because of discrimination laws against Chinese women going back to the Page Act in 1875 was like 20 to 1. It was a thousand to 1 in the Old West. And so what people did was, um, you know, there weren't enough women to marry. And so um, he extended his citizenship because there was a young single Chinese woman and her son that was going to be deported. So he, they married so that she could have his citizenship. And those were called paper sons and daughters, you know, or, or these arranged marriages that uh, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake destroyed the, the record so people could claim to be sons and daughters of people who lived in the United States and therefore they could become citizens. But he did this and this is what Chinese did. And so they they were called tricky, but even though they were just using their intelligence to fight discriminatory laws, uh, he ended up um, committing suicide. His body wasn't discovered for a week later, but he um, believed in philosophy and reading. And he gave me as part of my inheritance $50 so I could buy any book I wanted. And that's how I bought um, Martin Gardner's book on mathematical logic. And, um, you know, my own research finally came around where it was published in a descendant of Martin Gardner's column uh, by Ian Stewart. It was uh, using computers to, you know, generate a chaotic version of the liar paradox. So I guess sort of a long question. I became a logician because of my first love. I learned about my history because of the need to protect my daughters. And then after all this happened, my Aunt Catherine told me that my grandfather was a philosopher. And when mm -hmm. I got his notebooks and had them translated, he was a philosopher who was interested in mathematical puzzles. And here I thought I was going away from everything I grew up to be something totally different. And yet I, it comes around that 
I, I ended up learning about myself by following what I thought was a completely independent path. <laughs> Thank you. G.K. Chesterton talks a lot about coming home. Yeah. <laughs> Going around the world and coming home. <laughs> yeah. And how important that is. Christopher, we've got more history in front of us now. What next? Yeah, well, I'm curious to return to the question that we started with, or the topic we started with of hate crimes. Um, I think most, probably most people would think, oh, well, there was the, there was the, the, the Japanese internment camps in World War II. But really, since that time, there hasn't been um, overt acts of racism, or in this case, hate crimes against um, Asian Americans. Is, is, uh, they might not know, like, for instance, the, the struggles like the Filipino workers had to go through in the 60s and the like, and the, and, and the, the, the bigotry they had to face. Um, are these hate crimes a, a, a new eruption, or you, you look upon them as maybe just a, a intensification of something that has been continuous in America uh, since, say, the it, It's Second certainly War. been continuous. It's just in the news now but the structures of history that uh, obliterate the history of a people are uh, the same forces that allow these hate crimes to continue. The, the way I like to look at it is that they often uh, in the textbooks say, well, what are the contributions of this group? And they always name, you know, like in my university, C and Yang was the Nobel prize winner or David Ho who discovered, um, cure for AIDS or the cause for AIDS. And they, they just list these people. But I think that's a wrong story because it makes, it, you know, the Chinese were only important because they contributed uh, to create the Transcontinental Railroad, which made America a, a country from sea to shining sea. But it, it's not right. Um, the, the reason is, is that the way, this is how I look at it. Imagine a white light and you put it through a prism, a critical prism what you see is a whole rainbow of colors. If you look back at American history through a critical prism of race and um, ethnicity and gender and so forth, you see it was always multicultural. It's not just something that was discovered recently. And instead, it, it's not just your contributions to the mainstream, it's actually the struggles of ordinary people uh, that created that history, not just the people that are acknowledged. Uh, for example, the Q ordinance in San Francisco was uh, the the Chinese were they were cutting off their cues and they sued the um, the um, uh, they sued the uh, person who was enacting this law, and they pooled all their money together to fight it legally. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where it was heard by Justice Fields, was a famous um, um, uh, justice, and. What he ruled was that uh, it was illegal for this Q ordinance to be put in effect because it was targeting a group of people in a discriminatory way. And what happened was that the 14th Amendment was made to apply not only to citizens, but to anyone residing in America. And it was brought forth by these Chinese workers who pooled their money to fight this collectively. And they're not given, you know, a part part of uh, of history. They're not acknowledged. But this these kinds of things are important. It's people on the margins of society, not those in the mainstream, who have struggled for their uh, human rights and for their civil rights that has made America a more democratic place for everyone. And that's why I look at the margin margins, the, the marginalized histories, knowing that Latin American history, knowing the Chinese American history, knowing the Asian American history, knowing Italian American history, that you can see how the story that we've gotten is not the right one. It's not just people contributing to the, the white dominant narrative. It's really all people in America because of a kind of a melting pot and a place of welcoming immigrants uh, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to be free, that America became a more free and democratic place. And it didn't happen without a lot of blood and a lot of struggle. Let me uh, turn our direction a bit, although Gary, I'm 
turning the direction uh, prompted by something that you said not so long ago. Uh, Revelation, Book of Revelation, and the tree as it appears there. We can <clears throat> all be Marxists if we decide to look at everything in terms of class struggle. And we can be all of us critical race theorists if we look at everything through the struggle uh, among the races. But what we want to be are followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we want to be, first and foremost. And we believe that Jesus Christ founded a church. And what we found is in the life of that church, nations have oftentimes tried to uh, take over the church for themselves. It's one of the oldest stories in the history of the church. Mm -hmm. And we find that Christians have often been willing to compromise with the nations in which they found themselves. And of course, that's part and parcel of uh, our origin in Judaism, where the Jews oftentimes tied to uh, compromise with the nations around them in, in ways that went against God's law. And here in the United States, we could say that uh, I'm being very, very, very broad brush. I can't imagine a broader brush. But here in the United States, uh, Christians have become properly bourgeois in order to conform to the ethos of a, a capitalist society. And now we have, and of course, this is just manifestation 9027. Now we have the idea that in China, the church is just okay, so long as it's Chinified, Sinicization. And uh, here in the United States, we have pretty much the response, well, all right, whatever, just so long as we can maintain a, a, a profitable trade balance. <laughs> so we look at China in terms of economics, and China looks at the church in terms of Chinese uh, uh, state power. And uh, to put it in a very, very broad term and, and to add an element of <clears throat> modest humor to it, here on this show, we mostly believe in rum, Rome, and rebellion. <laughs> now, if you believe in rum, Rome, and rebellion, and I certainly do, uh, how would you assess what's going on in, in China under the direction, uh, not of the virtue, but under the direction of the centralization of power, pure and simple? Okay. Well, of course, I can't speak for, you know, what's going on in China today. When, when I went back in 1995 with the Society of Christian Philosophers, I had to teach myself about Chinese history and and. I wanted to give a piece that would, you know, speak about the gospel in China. And so I um, struggled very hard. I was in Port Jefferson. I stumbled into a bookstore and I found a book of Christian art done by Asian artists from all over the world. And I said, OK, this is what I'm going to use. I'll use these images because they'll be, get past the translators. And, and I also wanted to address the issue of Tiananmen Square without uh, doing it directly, um, because that would be against, you know, all of the, uh, the, uh, the delicacies of the politics. But I wanted to address that issue. So I, I looked at Paul's address to the, to the philosophers in the Areopagus and Mars Hill. And what he did was he, he, he talked about the uh, unknown God. Right. He, he, he saw all of these, the, you know, uh, religious relativism, all these gods. I mean, so the, here's this unknown God. And if you go back into Diogenes Laertes, it turns out this unknown God uh, is, you know, goes back even to Epimenides. Uh, Epimenides, uh, oftentimes logicians like to quote, um, um, you know, the book of Timothy, where it's Epimenides, one of the Cretans, one of their own, you know, lazy and so forth, but they said all Cretans are liars, right? Well, it turns out Epimenides had talked about this unknown God. And so uh, it, what I thought was that in every culture, there was a seed that God planted uh, so for the gospel to grow. And the key for me going to China was to find what that was. And for me, 
it was Tiananmen. It's the gate of heavenly peace. And so what I, I wanted to say in my talk was that the, the, the seed that had been planted in China, this, this um, Tiananmen, which was the gate to the, the you know, forbidden city where the ancient um, emperors lived, and also the square at which the pro-democracy movement took place, uh, could be this counterpart to the unknown God. You know, Tiananmen means gate of heavenly peace. Tian is, is heaven. And um, all of these events happened here, just like in, you know, um, Jacob's Ladder in the Old Testament, this, this way to heaven. And I, I thought, you know, I could declare what the true meaning of the gate of heavenly peace is, because Jesus is our peace. The gate to heaven is, you know, Jacob's Ladder in the Old Testament, and that the true meaning of the gate of heavenly peace is given in Christ. And so um, I went there sort of naive at the time. I threw a bunch of books into my um, suitcase. We're not, we weren't supposed to bring Bibles because that was illegal. But I, I threw some John Stott uh, books in there. I, I threw The Cost of Discipleship. Um, and so when I went there, I, I, I found that some of the scholars that we were talking to were very interested in Christian philosophy. The state was interested because they thought Christianity led to the Protestantism, which led to capitalism, which led to, uh, you know, productivity and so forth. Um, but some of these scholars were truly interested in, in um, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and so when I, when I was there, I wrote my name in Chinese and put it out there and I was trying to make a statement. And, and one of the, one of the scholars was a, uh, uh, you know, um, Bonhoeffer scholar. And I said, look, back in my, my hotel room, I have a copy of the cost of discipleship. I brought it. You can give it to one of your students. And, and he followed me all the way back to my hotel room. And I handed to him this book with a green cover. And he, he, he began to weep because he had never held a copy of that book. And this was his, the you know, his passion for scholarship. And because of the censorship, you know, they wouldn't let him have these books. And I think what had happened in China, there's the, there's the state-sponsored church, the three-self church, three-self patriotic church, and then there's the official versions, but there's also the underground church. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't know much about it. I gave my talk and, and the students rushed up to the translator and they said, what must I do to be saved because of these pictures by Asian artists? And, the, and Enoch Wan, who was our translator, I was sharing rooms with him and he told me that he had started the first Bible studies at Stony Brook where my university was. And I had met him just accidentally because I switched rooms with a theologian who didn't want to share rooms with him. And I said, of course, I'll share rooms with him. And, and, and what happened was um, the underground church contacted him. He had been trying to reach them for 12 years. And we went on this, you know, from place to place. And finally, we met with some people in the underground church. And, and I asked, you know, I, I, I opened up their their hymnal right and one of the things is one of my daughters after my wife lost her first child um I, I, there was a man named john wimber who prayed for my daughter to be born and when i opened that thing up the songs they had there was john wimber's spirit song and um so I, you know i gave them all my equipment that I had smuggled in so I could show the slides and all this sort of thing. And I said, what can I, you know, what can I do for you? You know, and they said, um, you know, just pray for us. And I said, will you, will you pray for America? Because I feel that your faith is so much stronger. And um, they agreed to pray. And that's when I came back to the U.S. after that. And I saw Charles Wong had gone to China. And I had my dad draw the plans and I submitted it. And all of this stuff happened. And I kind of attribute it to the sincerity of the believers in China. Uh, Enoch went back, uh, sponsored by a church I was attending, uh, to, to train uh, people to learn how to do their own Bible studies because they had been just listening to Christian radio. When the missionaries got kicked out of China, 
that's when the indigenous form of Christianity took root in China. And he taught him how to go to the scriptures and, you know, give their own lessons, not just memorize what these radio preachers had said. And these people said, now we can go home for the first time. You know, and, and he would tell stories. They would be locked up in a house at four in the morning and they would pray with their arms on the wall so that when, they're, when they would fall asleep, their head would hit the wall and they would keep praying. And, uh, you know, the, I think we could learn a lot um, when you say, you know, what the Great Commission in Matthew is pantatan ethne, is to go to all people groups. It's translated nations, but ethne is the word. And it means that, you know, people groups, you need to, to give the gospel in their heart language. So when it takes root, we learn more about the gospel because we've followed the Great Commission. It wasn't that, you know, the society of Christian philosophers knew what all Christianity was about and just had to be transplanted into China. But I thought we had so much to learn from them, you know, that, that it's not just about acting against your conscience or guilt. There was the removal of shame, that the Chinese was an important part of losing face. It was part of knowing solidarity and sin rather than individuals having, you know, just confess their faith to, uh, you know, say a sinner's prayer. But the, the, the community as a whole, um, you know, suffering in sin because of, 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 of what their forefathers had done and learning to be healed in groups. And that's why I think the gospel begins with the tree in Genesis and ends with the tree of life in, in Revelations because it's all the people groups that need us to teach us the fullness of the gospel that Jesus came to, 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 uh, to give us. Thank you, Gary, for that extraordinary account. We are at the end of our program and as you know we always end with the gospel for today which is a short gospel that's from John. Jesus said to his disciples as the father loves me so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. It's been great to connect with you after all these years. Well, what's it been? Four or five? <laughs> <laughs> My first I, article published with you. I thought I thought <laughs> I thought getting old would take longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let it take a little longer for all of us. All right. Godspeed. Thank you. Take care. Take care, Gary. Thank you.